1858, a lawyer and amateur natural scientist named William Parker Folk discovered a nearly complete dinosaur fossil in New Jersey. It was an extraordinary find. It was the first dinosaur species known from the United States from more than just teeth. It was named by a famous paleontologist, Joseph Leidy, who dubbed it Hadrosaurus Folkai. It was one of the most complete dinosaur fossils in the world at the time, the first dinosaur fossil to be mounted. It is now the state dinosaur of New Jersey, and it sparked an era of intense scientific and public interest that became known as dinosaur mania. Competition between museums over fossils was fierce, and a personal rivalry between two famous scientists would change the face of paleontology, even as they nearly destroyed each other in the process. The 19th century Bone Wars are history that deserve to be remembered. The story of the Bone Wars begins with the story of two paleontologists. In one corner was Othniel Charles Marsh, born in 1831 to a family of modest means. His father was a farmer, and his mother died when he was only three years old. He obtained higher education thanks to his uncle and mother's brother, philanthropist George Peabody. He usually went by O.C. as he disliked the name Othniel. He was something of a rarity of the Golden Age, a truly university-educated and learned scientist. He graduated from Yale's Sheffield Scientific School in an era where scientist wasn't a well-defined term, and many men without diplomas or schooling at all made careers in science. He had gone to Europe and learned at several great German universities, returned to America to become the country's first professor of paleontology. On the other side was Edward Drinker Cope, Born in 1840 into a wealthy Quaker family, he proved to be a prodigy at a young age and published his first scientific paper at 19, although he only attended school until he was age 16. Unlike Marsh, he had little scientific training, only briefly attended university under a prestigious paleontologist, Joseph Leidy. He read and worked in museums on his own time, but was always known for behavior that earned him poor marks and continued to be irascible as an adult, even getting in a fist fight with another scientist. His father pushed him continually to become a farmer, however, Cope was only interested in science. Ironically, while it was Cope who was born into a wealthy family, it was Marsh who always made use of money. He convinced his uncle, who donated extravagantly to Harvard, to do the same to his alma mater, Yale, and established the Peabody Museum of Natural History, with Marsh as a trustee. This donation likely helped him obtain the professorship of paleontology there, and he was never expected to teach. Cope and Marsh first met in Europe in the winter of 1863. Marsh was attending school in Berlin, while Cope, nine years younger, was touring the continent, visiting museums and meeting men of science. When they met, Marsh had two degrees, but only two published papers, while Cope had no degrees, but 37 publications. Initially, the two were fast friends, interested in the same things, and both brilliant. In 1867, Cope named a species after Marsh, Tonius Marshi, in the following year, Marsh returned the favor, naming a new and gigantic serpent, Mosasaurus copianus. But it didn't take long for cracks to appear. Marsh had discovered the Mosasaurus in New Jersey, which Cope considered his hunting ground, and he referred to the specimen Marsh found as the one that got away. In 1869, Marsh traveled to Philadelphia, where Cope was working on an ambitious project at the Academy of Natural Sciences, putting together the fossils of a kind of plesiosaur. Cope described it as different from Plesiosaurus in the enormous length of the tail and the relatively short neck. He called it Elasmosaurus and constructed it using comparative anatomy techniques he had learned from Leidy. The specimen was so odd that Cope even gave it a new taxonomic order and prepared a paper about what was certainly the largest and most significant contribution yet. Marsh had always been happy to point others' mistakes and had contradicted a Harvard professor early in his career. It was him who first declared the Cardiff giant a hoax. He looked over his friend's reconstruction. He immediately noticed something off about it. I suggested to him gently that he had the whole thing wrong. Indeed, Cope had put the head on the wrong end. Where Marsh claimed he had been gentle, Cope described the criticism as caustic. Cope was horrified and quickly tried to buy up all the copies of the American Philosophical Society in which his paper had appeared. Worse, as Cope soon learned, Marsh was actively digging through the beds of New Jersey, and more and more fossils were getting away from him. With Yale's backing and support from the military, Marsh set up his first journey west in 1870. The west was widely considered to be a paleontological treasure trove, and it would prove to live up to those expectations. The expedition was a success, and he discovered numerous North American horses and titanotherium, 
But Cope and Lighty were listening in via their own agent in the area, who was already sending them fossils instead of Marsh. Professor Marsh feels very badly about me having provided you with specimens, the agent wrote on November 12, 1870. If you have not published the new species circled, please do not delay. Marsh returned and soon began to turn out papers, including a report on the first pterosaur discovered in America. Though Cope's family was wealthy, his father was never terribly interested in Cope's choice of profession, and giving Cope a farm, which he later sold to finance his work. Cope had a family, but determined to go west anyway in 1871. Marsh stopped briefly in Kansas before continuing, but Cope arrived shortly afterwards and used one of Marsh's own guides to track down Kansas specimens. Marsh was remarkably possessive over the areas he found, including the Kansas region and his finds in the Bridger Basin of Wyoming, though he was not the first to explore either. The winter of 1871-72 saw the real difference in Marsh and Cope's approaches as an open break appeared. Cope fired off publications quickly, but was prone to mistakes, while Marsh published sparingly and only after methodical research. This meant that Marsh watched Cope publish papers on specimens of the same fossils Marsh had in his collections, but had not yet published. They also differed in their fundamental beliefs about evolution. Marsh was a firm believer in Darwin and the origin of species, and saw his finds, especially regarding horses, as describing natural selection. Cope, a devout Quaker, couldn't stomach the moral, religious, and social implications and became a leader in neo-Lamarckism. In his words, the science of evolution was the science of creation, and he incorporated the Lamarckian idea that environmental adaptations, that is not genetic, could be passed down to offspring. In 1872, Cope arrived in Wyoming as chief paleontologist of the U.S. Geological and Geographical Survey of the Territories. While it offered no pay and little else, it added some prestige and authority. Still, he found on arriving at Fort Bridger that there were no suppliers waiting. Cope had to find us his own supplies and soon found the first dinosaur of the war, the partial skeleton of Agathamus sylvestris. Most of the early finds for both Marsh and Cope were mammals and animals of the Eocene from about 55.8 to 33.9 million years ago. He began publishing discoveries even before he got back to the East Coast. At least once, Cope watched Marsh leave a site and then explored it himself, taking off with finds he figured Marsh had overlooked. But actually, they'd been left there for Cope. It took 20 years for Cope's mistaken species to be corrected. This began a period of unprecedented number of discoveries. Lydie, Marsh, and Cope were all making discoveries, often of the same species, and they knew it. Fighting over precedence for naming continued for months. Marsh openly attacked Cope's work. Cope and Marsh were openly fighting in several prestigious American journals and societies. The first salvo via letter, after Cope returned some of Marsh's fossils mistakenly sent to him. Marsh responded with fury over a paper postmarked January 18th, but dated January 16th. The information I received on the subject made me very angry, he wrote, and threatened to publish this with some of your other transgressions. Cope immediately fired back, claiming all the specimens you obtained during August 1872 you owe to me. Fighting in the journals, Marsh was able to argue that his names or Lydie's had precedence, and none of Cope's names were valid. Marsh pointed out mistakes and claimed that one of Cope's descriptions has to be impossible unless, indeed, this mythical animal has changed characteristics more rapidly than even Darwin himself imagined. They fought back and forth for so long that the naturalists refused to print any more responses from either of them unless they paid for it themselves. Each added another rebuttal. It wasn't until the late 1870s that the competition became focused on dinosaur bones, and Marsh would work through proxies after 1874. He spent little time out west in person. In 1877, Arthur Lakes stumbled upon bones just west of Denver in Morrison, what he called a Herculean war club, 10 inches in diameter and 2 feet long. Lakes contacted Marsh and Cope, saying that he felt inclined to part with them to the highest bidder. Marsh's money went out with the Morrison finds, and to get the fossils out quicker, they began using gunpowder and dynamite. Cope, meanwhile, had his own dig in Canyon City, but Marsh wanted those too. Marsh dispatched men who were able to buy some fossils right out from under Cope's nose, including the diminutive Nanosaurus. In 1878, Marsh became president of the National Academy of Sciences and opened a new theater of the war. He sought to combine the various geological, mapping, and paleontological surveys spread between the war, interior, and land offices into a single survey. Cope worked largely with the interior survey, and if combined, would lose the position. But he was in Europe and unable to provide much of a fight, while Marsh pushed his ideas through Congress, battling other interests. Ultimately, the U.S. Geological Survey was formed, consolidating the other surveys, and a Marsh ally was put in charge. Marsh hoped to cut Cope off from the western boneyards entirely, 
This eventually led to Marsh being made chief paleontologist of the survey, but he had a problem. By his own machinations, those who worked with the survey did not own the specimens they collected, but a deal was made that allowed Marsh to keep the most important specimens at Yale. Meanwhile, Marsh got word from two railroad men who had discovered bones west of Cheyenne at Como Bluffs. The find was incredible, and he'd been called perhaps the greatest dinosaur boneyard of all time. Marsh, however, was always late paying his employees and unpleasant to work with, which caused one of the men to defect to Cope. Marsh was known to order his people to destroy fossils rather than let them fall into Cope's hands. By the 1880s, Cope was getting desperate for money. He had spent through the inheritance from his father and lost more attempting to make money in mining. By 1890, he was nearly destitute, and it was then that Marsh and the head of the geological survey, John Wesley Powell, tried to claim Cope's only assets, his fossils, as property of the government. Cope was prepared to fire back. For years, he had collected testimony from disgruntled Marsh assistants, and he brought the wide-ranging complaints to the newspapers. He sought to discredit both Marsh and Powell, accusing Powell of misusing funds and controlling a politico-scientific monopoly, while he attacked Marsh for plagiarizing from his assistants. The New York Herald carried the headline, Scientists Wage Bitter Warfare. One former Marsh employee claimed that in the many years he knew him, I never knew him to do two consecutive honest days' work in science. It dragged in long lists of other scientists, and the scientific community was shocked that the fight had spilled into public. By 1892, the attack found allies from other enemies of Powell in the Geological Survey, and Marsh's secrecy and hoarding of fossils came under attack. Paleontology was stripped entirely from the survey. Marsh lost his cushy job, but for Congress, the target was primarily Powell. In the 1890s, Cope returned to the field and was able to recover some of his finances. Marsh then had his own financial woes. He always lived bigger than Cope and built a mansion he was forced to mortgage. Then the 1893 crash left him considerably humbled, and he couldn't finance Western expeditions any longer. While Cope was known for making hurried mistakes in his many papers, it was Marsh who made the most famous mistake. From Como Bluffs came a sauropod skeleton that was nearly complete, but had no skull. He attached a head from another site that seemed right and called it Brontosaurus. The skull turned out to be incorrect and has caused decades of disagreement over whether Brontosaurus even exists or if it was simply a misidentified Apatosaurus. In 2015, several researchers defended the genus as separate from Apatosaurus. In the 1890s, Cope sold about 40% of his collection for $32,000, around a million dollars in 2022, adjusted for inflation. He became ill, mostly self-medicated with morphine, belladonna, and formalin, a substance in formaldehyde. He refused to have surgery and died on April 12, 1897, 56 years old. Marsh died two years later on March 18, 1899. Despite the bad blood between the two, their impact on paleontology was profound. Before they began their trips to the West, there were only nine named dinosaur species. Between the two of them, they described more than 120 more. Both discovered many more species as well, and Mars contributed significantly to evolutionary theory, publishing over 1,400 papers on a huge variety of scientific pursuits. So uh, who won the Bone Wars? Well, Marsh named more dinosaurs than Cope, naming 86 species to Cope's mere 56. But actually, most of those species' names didn't survive. That's not uncommon. And a scientist names a dinosaur species, it's often upon further review found to be either an already identified species or identified from insufficient information or not a dinosaur at all. Science writer Mark Jaffe noted in his book on the Bone Wars, The Gilded Dinosaur, that for every 10 dinosaur genre named since 1824, nine of them turned out to be not valid. Marsh also published possibly the most influential dinosaur book of all time with his Dinosaurs of North America. Between the two of them, they discovered some of the most famous dinosaurs of all time, including the species of Triceratops, Stegosaurus, and Gamarasaurus. Cope described over a thousand new vertebrate species, including hundreds of fish and reptiles, including famous non-dinosaur Dimetrodon. Though they nearly destroyed themselves and each other in their zeal for science and fame, though their methods may actually have destroyed many specimens, both men unquestionably advanced the field of paleontology, even if unraveling their many species named and bone collections took decades. In the end, the winner of the Bone Wars might have been paleontology itself. And the millions of us who enjoy seeing those massive bones in museums of natural history.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.